trying to reach perfection in music or any art, it's an illusion. It's like trying to reach the horizon. The closer you come, the more it goes away. My name is Misha Majski. I play cello sometimes. And this is living the classical life. Thank you so much for being on the show. It is a pleasure to welcome you here in Tokyo, of all places. Thank you, Henry. I wanted to begin by talking about Radulupu, because for me, really, his sound and his artistry, as I experienced many times in concerts, I had a chance to meet with him, and of course I collected his recordings. His sound and his phrasing really defined how I hear music. Um, I know that you performed together with him. Were you also friends? Oh yes, very much so. We studied together in Moscow Conservatory at the same time. He was a couple of years older, but still, uh, and uh, we performed there on several occasions, including some of the most unforgettable concerts of my life which uh, I could show you the picture of the poster which I brought with me from Russia and uh, which I still have in my studio of complete Beethoven sonatas and variations in two concerts on the 7th and 11th of May 1969 and that was part of his final examination as a pianist, he presented all, for choice all Beethoven concertos and for chamber musical sonatas and variations for piano and cello. And I even, because of this, they were so impressed with this that I got my final exam in chamber music in advance. And because of this, uh, the only two exams which are missing for my complete diploma, which I never got, uh, are the final exam cello playing and scientific communism. So I have 61 uh, exams out of 63 uh, at the time in Moscow Conservatory. And Do you actually remember what you were playing together? I'm curious about Yes, yes we played uh, in these two concerts, we played complete uh, Beethoven sonatas and variations as a cycle, but we played before Cesar Frank sonata, that was our first uh, concert on stage. It was chamber music concert of his professor, chamber music professor. Uh, we, we had different teachers, but uh, it was a French program, and he asked me to play with him. Uh, and since it was a very long concert, we were supposed to play only the first two movements. But then we rehearsed for the first time, just about the day before the concert. Uh, it went very well, and he said, 
why do we have to play only two moments? Let's play the whole sonata. I said, yeah, you played many times, you know it. I didn't play this. Said, oh, but okay, it's easy. You play with music, so slow movements, not problem. And last moment, you know, it's simple. I start and you just kind of da 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 Yeah, of course, it was a joke. It wasn't that simple. But, you know, we were young and uh, daring. But it was a surprise for everybody. So I uh, got this idea of doing the all four moments attacker uh, uh -huh. in order not to stop the applause after second moment with it complete attacker, which I think musically is very works very well, and I still like to do this whenever we play it. What was he like as as a man? Because I think for my generation and younger, we probably view him as a very private man, perhaps serious and shy, but I understand he actually had quite a sense of humor. Oh, yes, absolutely. He was, he was quite incredible in so many different ways. Uh, not just as a musician, but as, as a phenomenal mind and intellect and, and, uh, and at the same time incredibly humble, uh, maybe even too much so to the point of being insecure about many things, uh, even languages. He spoke so many languages, but since, you know, his first language, I, I relate to this actually very much so these days because uh, his first language was, of course, Romanian. My first language happened to be Russian, but since I'm by now two thirds of my life out of Russia and hardly ever speak Russian. Uh, it's, it's not that it's difficult, but I, I still can speak Russian, of course. But if, for example, interviews, I, I prefer to do in English because I'm used to it much more. Uh, in Russian, it's more difficult to translate from English, which is very strange. And then, since I never learned English, I just picked it up on the streets of Los Angeles while studying with Pitygorsky. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, I, I could easily quote one of the many jokes of Ivory Gitlis, who used to say, I speak Zvelt languages, English the best. <laughs> so that's about the case with me. I, uh, because, and he had the same complex. He said that he lost his Romanian and he spoke a lot of Russian when studying there. And then, of course, English. Uh, but he spoke wonderful uh, almost everything. So, But he was very modest and humble man. Uh, and, uh, but it's uh, one of the signs of really great uh, musician or great uh, man to realize your limitations and and so there was also collaboration together if I can only speak for myself when I'm collaborating with my friends I'm always learning from them and I'm learning from their musicianship what did you learn if anything from working with Radu oh plenty of things particularly about the sound production that was uh, extremely important for him and uh, for me as well, always, but uh, uh, certain very subtle approach to, to, for me, actually, at the end of the day, uh, if you think about it, that's what makes the biggest difference between most interpreters. It's the, the certain quality of sound which uh, not only in our case, because we're playing old Italian, mostly Italian instruments, they have their own personality, and, uh, but still the same, we experimented with colleagues and friends. The same cello will never sound the same with anybody else, but even with this big black monsters, it's amazing. But, but most amazing actually for me was when, for, in 1974, I was for the first time the soloist with Israel Philharmonic Orchestra on tour in the United States. I played the same piece, Tchaikovsky Rococo Variations, uh, with the same orchestra with three different conductors. Three different conductors. Yep, and we changed conductors. Uh, it was uh, at the time still young, Andrew Davis, not before he was knighted. Uh, first concert, which we did without even rehearsal because the half of the orchestra got stuck in Florida and arrived half an hour before the concert, which was a very scary experience. The next day we rehearsed with Zubin Mehta and did <laughs> second concert with him, and then five concerts with Daniel Barenboim. And what was amazing, I, every day I, I looked to make sure that uh, 
nobody changed music. It was the same concert master, the same musicians, the same mus instruments. The sound was different, not just interpretation, the sound. So even conductor without any physical contact with his instrument can influence the sounds to such an extent. So I'm so curious to know, speaking about learning this life philosophy and the early training, I think for most people, even in the music world, it's hard to imagine the level of intensity of the training that you had in Moscow Conservatory. I know that you were studying with Rostropovich. I never had the pleasure of meeting him, but I get the sense that he was the type of idealistic person for whom a clock is not the indication of when you're supposed to sleep. I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of how it was to work with him and to study with him. Oh, it was amazing. I mean, the only problem was that he, unfortunately for us, uh, uh, was traveling so much and was absent a lot of times. But when he was there, it was just like volcano, you know, the energy and, uh, I mean, uh, I am. I would dare, as I did before on several occasions, to say something which you know that you know everybody knows that he was arguably one of the greatest cellists ever. Uh, but I would dare to say that, in a way, he was maybe even greater teacher than. Uh, Cellist, and because this uh, wooden box was just not enough for him to express all of his incredible knowledge and fantasy, and uh, and uh, probably one of the reasons that was one of the reasons he started conducting. But teaching was for him very important, and and he was a phenomenal teacher. Uh, he never basically touched cello during the lessons. He always sat at the second piano because he was, he was a fantastic pianist. pianist. And he would play whole orchestra and more. And uh, anyway, they, it was totally unique. And I mean, it was dream of my life uh, since I was eight years old and started playing cello <clears throat> to study with him. And then it became dream come true. But uh, incredibly so, I was very lucky to have even more, uh, even closer and more intense type of relationship with him than just teacher and student. He literally became like second father to me because my father passed away very suddenly a few months, six months before I uh, started studying with him. And he heard about it and he was incredibly supportive. And then eventually, when after Tchaikovsky competition, he took me to his class, to Moscow Conservatory. You know, maybe partly because one of his very few unfulfilled ambitions in life was to have a son. He had two beautiful daughters, but he wanted to have son to continue the name, uh, whatever, anyway. And he even told me when we met last time, about a year and a half before his death, I mean, Kronberg Cello Festival, we had very heart-to-heart -heart conversation. And he told me, you were like a son to me. Then he added, prodigal son. <laughs> because the fact that I went to Pitigorsky to Los Angeles, even though it was his idea, he recommended this to me when I asked him for advice before leaving Soviet Union. But as I realized much later, he probably was hoping that my reaction will be after Strapovich, there is nobody. And not only I went to Pitigorsky, but I always in all the interviews said that these four months in California with Pitigorsky was the best time of my life. Immediately clarifying that I'm not implying that Pitigorsky was a better teacher than Strapovich. It would be as stupid as to say that Mozart was a better composer than Bach. But I was a better student. <laughs> it was the beginning of my new life. I was full of positive energy. And it was, unfortunately, the end of Pitigorsky's life, and he knew it. He had lung cancer because of smoking all his life. And he loved speaking Russian. He spoke beautiful Russian, different than we speak nowadays. And since I hardly spoke any English, of course, we communicate in Russian. 
So it was very intense. I probably spent more time with Pitygorsky in four months than with Shapovich in four years. But it was not even a question of quantity, but uh, twice a week I was, was with him at USC, where he was teaching in the class, but uh, the rest of the, um, practically every day at his home. Uh, we, every day we played ch game of chess, which he loved as well as me. We went for long walks, had lunch together, and, uh, and every day I played for him a different piece of music. That was kind of rule, to go through as much music as possible. So I played everything I could and everything I couldn't. That was not the point. But the point was for him to give me certain directions and food for thought, which I, in a way, feel I'm still digesting. So it was really incredible time, and incredibly so. I felt like if Rostropovich became like second father to me in my first life, then Pitygorsky in a way became like second father in my second life because you know I calculate my age from 7th of November 1972 when I arrived to Vienna on the way to Israel when I had to start everything from scratch. So by this calculation, I'm just nearing my half a century. <laughs> and actually, talking of this, I, uh, Rostropovich, before I left, asked him for advice, particularly about uh, finishing my education since I never got diploma in Moscow. Uh, his reaction was, no, oh, diploma is a piece of paper. It's not so important. But uh, it all depends how your life will develop in the West. If you will be incredibly lucky and will be able to support yourself with some concerts, I think you can manage already yourself. However, I must warn you, for a young unknown cellist to make solo career in the West will be very difficult, particularly first 50 years. Then it's getting easier. So <laughs> I, I can't wait for this last few months because I hope it will get easier. Well, next year. So you studied with these, these two legends, two big personalities, so then you finish. Did you ever feel really finished with your studies? Not at all. Uh, you never finish, uh, hopefully. At least that's the idea. If the more you learn, the more you realize how little you know and how much more there is to learn. So it's continuous processes. So I always say that trying to reach perfection in music or any art, it's an illusion. It's like trying to reach the horizon. The closer you come, the more it goes away. It doesn't mean that one shouldn't try to come closer. But as long as you realize that you will never touch it, then there is no frustration. And uh, we, we, I could make a huge, endless almost, list of people, mostly musicians, of course, but not only whom I, in a way, could call my teachers. So, because you can learn from any life experience and any encounter being uh, playing chamber music together with different uh, musicians or different conductors or orchestras or, or listening to uh, different musicians and not only musicians, of course, but, but I always make this point because I know some of my colleagues proudly um, say that they never listen to recordings, uh, particularly other cellists. Mm -hmm. I do. You do? Oh, yes, whenever I have chance. Traveling, of course, it's not easy, but now with uh, iPhone and everything, uh, iPad, it's uh, it's, um, yeah, I try to listen to as much music, not only classical, mostly classical, um, but as possible, and because you can always learn uh, continuously from something new and interesting you can hear, or from others' mistakes, in order not to repeat them. And from your mistakes, I listen to my recordings as well, not very often, but sometimes, because I, I had this experience totally by chance, once playing, I remember in Zurich, in Switzerland, with orchestra after the rehearsal on the way to the hotel, I passed a small kind of fancy hi-fi shop, and I saw in the window these speakers, Bang & Olufsen flat speakers, oh, which, yeah, start making, which uh, I had, I read very good review. So I wanted to hear the speakers, so I asked to listen to speakers, and the gentleman asked me if, what kind of music I want to hear, classical, jazz, pop, I said classical. So he put this Yamaha CD, it was 
Martin Yamaha. But uh, later I realized Yamaha at the time was collaborating with Deutsche Grammophon, so it was Deutsche Grammophon recordings. So there was orchestra playing and pianists, violinists, singers. And then suddenly there was Bure from C major, number three, cello seed by Bach. And I just couldn't believe it. Uh, it sounded like somebody was making fun of me. <laughs> it's a little bit like this caricature of me. You know, it's, uh, it, it kind of looks like me, but not really. So, uh, because there were certain things which I knew nobody does it, but I, I, I just couldn't believe it. it was my recording, which it was when I, uh, I realized, because I didn't hear it for many years. I, it was shocking how much I changed. And uh, I couldn't sleep all night. Next day when I came home, I first thing, found the CDs and listened to all six feeds and realized that uh, gradually, there was no revolution. I'm generally against revolutions uh, because it inevitably involves violence. But it was evolution, which uh, in certain parts was rather important. And I realized it's like, you know, Sometimes you go to the concert, you take the program, and you see the picture of this beautiful, particularly young, <laughs> gorgeous-looking singer. And then somebody comes on stage and says, wait a minute, who, who, who is this? Yeah, when the pictures are 40 years old, it's not representative anymore. So it's like taking up-to-date, updated pictures, so to say. And I realized, and I, uh, I decided I want to record uh, Bach Suites again, which I eventually did. But of course, it's since long time outdated again. And uh, but by listening to your own old recordings, you can try to follow certain development or lack of it as well. And uh, there is nothing wrong. Uh, of course, I, I certainly agree in that uh, one should first of all. Uh, be incredibly faithful to the score. Uh, that's most important. One shouldn't learn uh, just from different interpretations. Uh, but uh, in the same time, I don't see anything wrong with uh, combining both. So you talked about your following your growth and development, hopefully. Was there a point where you recognized for yourself your own voice, if you could call it that, that, that you sound like yourself? Did you, did you feel like you could be yourself? No, I mean, as Oscar Wilde said, uh, you better be yourself because everybody else is already taken. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, when I played in Tchaikovsky competition, it was before I started studying with Rostropovich. I was the only uh, of five young Soviet cellists who was not his student this year in 1966. But one of the jury members in the interview obviously trying to give me biggest compliment I could imagine at the time, um, said that he thinks we have something, he said, like second Rostropovich of the future, something like this. And of course, it was the greatest compliment. At the same time, I never wanted to be second Rostropovich. Nobody needs second or third Rostropovich. Rostropovich was unique like all great artists. So um, I always was who I was and who I am. and. Uh, that's uh, the beauty of uh, uh, life and music, uh, that uh, uh, it's very subjective and, uh, and that's why so many musicians keep playing the same music again and again and it's never the same and never boring. How about collaborations versus solo playing? I, I heard you play the Bach Suites in Lugano and I know that uh, there we also heard you collaborate with Martha Argerich, your longtime friend and collaborator. Do you feel more comfortable one way or the other? Well, it's very different. I, it's a completely different experience. Playing box it's uh, all evening. Uh, Rostropovich told me this ages ago, and I totally agree. There is nothing more difficult, no matter how much you play. It. Because uh, the amount of uh, the, the concentration it requires, there's not a millisecond you can just kind of relax and uh, switch off because uh, being on stage alone all evening and uh, playing 
relatively speaking, similar music to keep the, the concentration of the audience. It requires incredible amount of energy. And uh, if I change shorts between the seats, it's not at all in order to make some kind of fashion show, but because I'm completely soaking wet most of the time. And um, yeah, but uh, and playing duos with great partners like Marta is just uh, a dream always, but not only, of course, in, uh, particularly as well with my children, my daughter, and with my younger son, I start playing as well as a pianist, and with my older son as a trio. It uh, always was uh, like a dream of my life and very special experience. Or playing chamber music in general, bigger groups, it's always incredibly exciting. And uh, or playing with orchestra, it's again something completely different. But um, it requires as well being very open-minded and flexible. And, and I believe it's very important. That's what keeps you young, so to say, uh, being flexible, of course, hopefully physically, but as well in your mind and, your, and not s stuck in your own ideas. Because uh, you can always learn from anyone. And it's, it's not in question. Of course, obviously, when I play with my children or with other younger musicians, uh, logically speaking, because of years of experience, I guess one could make an argument that I have more to share with them. But uh, I don't even feel this way. I'm always very happy and open-minded uh, to, to learn. Um, and uh, Because I think it's, uh, it's very important and very fascinating. And of course, playing with Marta being, uh, that's one of the reasons, you know, I always say I'm the luckiest cellist in the world for many different reasons, even though I always say that anybody can claim this, it's very subjective. If you feel this way, then you are. But I do have objective reasons, the fact that I'm the only one who had this great privilege to study with both Rostropovich and Pitygorsky is one thing, meeting Casals, as I said, and playing for him, uh, finding my cello, uh, 40, eight and a half years ago was just a miracle and uh, falling in love and still uh, continuing our love affair after all these years. And of course, my partners in chamber music, as I, you mentioned, Rado Lupu was still in Moscow Conservatory and some other musicians. And after I left, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't even dare to start making lists because I inevitably will forget somebody, which would be not fair. But Marta Argerich, of course, uh, it's the longest and most unique collaboration that I'm lucky to have since 47 years almost in counting. And uh, I mean, she's, of course, we could make separate conversations. Separate conversation about, about either. You talked about your children being musical. So what was your reaction when they said, I want to be a musician? And you say, oh my goodness, don't do that. Or conversely, at this stage of your musical life, when you look back, if you could do something differently, what do you advise them about going into a musical life? Yeah, it's interesting because it's my personal attitude, I must confess, changed somewhat. Because I have six children, you know, Bach wrote six suites, I have six kids. And as I always say, I'm not planning to compete with Bach who had 20 because nobody could compete with Bach in any way. <laughs> anyway, but that's something else. Uh, no, when Sasha was born, my second uh, child, and Lily was two years old, uh, I told my wife at the time, their mother, uh, wouldn't it be fantastic if Lily would play piano and Sasha would play violin, we could play together, travel together? And she said, don't hold your breath. Because very often children of musicians don't want to become musicians or they're not gifted enough. It's like, you know, good wine takes generation in between. What I'm trying to say that I was determined, I, not determined, but I felt it would be fantastic if they would become professional musicians. Even though some of my colleagues uh, told me, oh, don't torture the poor kids, let them have their childhood. And, uh, I still believe that it's the greatest profession that I know. There are, I'm sure there are others who feel the same, but uh, having this unique privilege 
of yeah. combining something which you love and enjoy and passionate about more than anything else with your profession and sharing it with uh, millions, not just thousands, but millions of people if you're lucky. It's, it's just uh, unbelievable privilege. So I think it's fantastic profession, as difficult as it is. But to be perfectly honest, even though all of my kids, including the youngest seven-year-old, uh, they play piano and study music, but uh, I'm really not uh, at all anymore determined for them to become professional musicians. The third one, Maximilian, who is 17 by now, is seriously playing piano, and uh, we start playing together, as I mentioned. So half of my kids kind of into music seriously, and the others uh, just, for me, it's most important for them to have connection uh, with great music, and which helps them to develop uh, in so many different ways, and uh, laugh and appreciate and admire uh, music and art in general. Uh, and uh, what they will end up doing in life, it's there are many different uh, paths in life. So one of the things that we have been very fortunate to hear in terms of feedback of the young people who watch this show, many of them have just graduated from conservatory and they might wonder what happens next. Now, I know that the music world today might be quite different from the musical world that you knew back then, but with the young people that you encounter today, what do you advise them? Does it have to be competitions, for example? No, not at all, but I mean, there are many examples of incredible musicians who were incredibly successful without any competitions. And of course, competitions could help, even though I'm not a big fan of competitions. I kind of agree with what Bella Bartok said, that competitions are for horses. However, it has, like everything in life, it has its positive side. I've been too many times and on the other side, well, young, so I actually swore never to uh, participate in a jury because uh, of competitions. I didn't feel and don't feel like judging anybody. Who am I to judge? However, uh, my older children, who are both professional musicians, convinced me at some point to manage to change my mind because they said, since you don't have your own students, because I don't teach uh, in conventional sense of the word in any case, uh, you have chance to kind of uh, counterbalance this, um, what's going on in the competitions with their own students and, and all kind of other things. And maybe it's um, responsibility on your part to, to, to do this. So I did twice Shikovsky competition, now Queen Elizabeth competition in Brussels, actually next week when I'm coming back, I'm going to sit in the finals again. And it was, Revelation for me, very interesting, because it gave me a chance to hear many fantastic young cellists. I mean, amazing. The level of cello playing is just, I'm speechless, basically. When during Tchaikovsky competition, after the second round, the jury chose me to, to announce the results, who is was getting into the finals. I got up and I was so nervous. I couldn't believe it. My heartbeat was just doo, 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 doo. I don't remember being so nervous playing concerts. Hmm. So I looked down, they were sitting there, and I told them, you know, I think I might be more nervous than you are because it's almost exactly half a century. It was 49 years since 1966 I was sitting there. I remember this like yesterday. So I know how you feel. And because the level was so incredibly high that, in my personal opinion, you all deserve to play in the finals. But it was impossible. We had to, choice, to choose. So for those who didn't get to the finals, the only thing I can say, it's not the end of life. In my last two competitions, I didn't get to the finals. And then I almost said, I managed, I'm very proud of this, to censor myself, but I almost want to say, 
I still got six most incredible children. So, <laughs> but it was of course not the moment for jokes. I thought I'm very serious about it. Uh, no, but what I, I, there are so many examples of winners of competitions whom nobody remembers or other way around. Other way around. Arturo Benedetti, Michelangelo in Queen Elizabeth competition was seventh. Seventh, or eight. yes. Didn't hurt him very much. So yeah, but um, in any case, there are many different ways to, and, and as well, nowadays with modern technology, for example, Tchaikovsky, probably Queen Elizabeth well, all the competitions now recorded and on Medici, you can still watch uh, everything. So you, the young musicians get such incredible exposure, even if you didn't win. You have chance at my time, you know, we could only dream of being able to record ourselves on a little cassette recorder and make it available to somebody to hear. So, yeah, it's, the times changed completely in, in many ways, and there are many advantages. Uh, and disadvantages, when I, when people, talk to me about them and I think myself about being able, not only I studied with Rostropovich in Moscow, but basically on a daily basis, we almost literally bumped into musicians like Oistrakh, Richter, Gillels, Kogan, Shostakovich himself, and many, many others. I mean, I hardly can believe it. It just, I, I want to pinch myself, and, <laughs> but it's true. And it's not that we didn't appreciate, uh, of course we did, but uh, now it sounds even more incredible. And of course, I'm sure for younger generation of uh, musicians, it must be uh, amazing to hear this. The, or the fact that I was incredibly lucky to not just to meet, but to play for Pablo Casals uh, two months before he passed away at the age of, he was almost 97 years young, as I always say, it's a very important point. It's just literally unbelievable. On the other hand, okay, uh, they have so many other advantages with internet and modern technology. They have access to so much information and recordings and uh, everything which we couldn't even dream of. So, yeah, it's not easy. I can only <laughs> again quote Rostropovich and that they can just, after they finish studying, they can start their 50 years of very hard breaking into <laughs> so-called career circle. But uh, at the end of the day, success is a very relative thing. It's, uh, of course, as they say, it's better to be young, healthy, beautiful, and wealthy than old, sick, and poor, and so on. But, uh, uh, yeah, as long as you love what you do and passionate about it and, and, uh, and of course have chance to share it with uh, people that way, that's main point of advantage of, of uh, success. And finally, I'm curious to ask you, at this stage of your life when you've already achieved so many things that others would aspire to, what's inspiring you these days musically or just in life in general? Oh, so many things. I mean, life is just unbelievable. In, you, in many ways, not always positive. I must, <laughs> of course, uh, obviously. But uh, actually, even this fact, you know, I had a very, I could say, complicated life. I had all kinds of experiences, not all of them easy, so to say. My two years, last two years in Soviet Union, I didn't even see my cello, much less play it. I spent four months in jail, actually, but then four, additional 14 months in so-called labor camp, and then two months in mental hospital in order to avoid military service mm. uh, before I managed to immigrate. So it was uh, very unusual and very difficult, in a way, experience, but in the same time, uh, now that I think about it, not only I don't regret it, I actually, in 
maybe some kind of perverse way, uh, even grateful to my destiny, or whatever you want to call it, for having had this experience. Because as difficult as it was, it uh, helped me to mature in many different ways as a human being and as a musician. Inevitably, it's very much connected. And uh, because it makes you any difficult experience in life helps you to appreciate things which we unfortunately very often t take for granted. And uh, so life is beautiful despite everything. And uh, yeah, but of course being a musician and on a daily basis uh, encountering this unbelievable genius of music that we uh, play, uh, what more inspiring can be. Uh, and uh, being still relatively healthy and able physically to travel and perform all over the world in very different, fascinating places like Japan, for example, right now, or many other parts of the world, and communicate through this most unique and international language of music uh, with people of completely different backgrounds and traditions and cultures. It's an uh, amazing feeling, which uh, I find it very inspiring and very, which gives you energy and helps you to go on. And when you get sometimes letters or, or remarks after the concerts, uh, people saying things which are hard to believe, but that uh, it changed their life in a certain way. And uh, it really makes it worth all the sacrifices and difficulties of this life. Mr. Maisky, thank you so much for sharing of your life and your musical experiences. It was a great pleasure on the day of your concert, which I am privileged to be able to say I will be there tonight and to meet with us. Thank you so much. Really thank a you. great, great pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much.